Our next presenter is Edith Ritt Coulter. Edith is a PhD candidate in the History Department at the University of North Texas. She specializes in concepts of body, place, and identity within the African diaspora, focusing on late 19th and early 20th century African American history. She is currently working on her dissertation entitled Creating Black Space, the Development of Oklahoma City's African American Community. She has published articles on enslaved foodways and the African American experience during the First World War. Ms. Ritt Coulter will now present The Elder Dungy, an examination of the life and influence of John William Dungy in early Oklahoma. Hi everyone, so today I'm gonna to be discussing the second chapter of my dissertation that focuses on the contributions of the Dungy family in Oklahoma City's black community. I believe that by examining the life of Roscoe Dungy's father, one of Oklahoma's most notable um, activists, journalists, pioneers for the NAACP, that we will better understand how he instilled in his children a sense of political consciousness that is rooted in the ideology of racial uplift, um, which has had lasting impacts on Oklahoma's community. All right. So John William Dungy's life is usually discussed alongside uh, larger works on his son Roscoe or his daughter Drusilla. Uh, his life and his early contributions to Oklahoma City's African American community created a space for his children to flourish and advance his ideologies that helped them help set the foundation for race work in Oklahoma City during the early 20th century. Uh, Linwood Morning Boone's work, The Chronological History of the Roanoke Missionary Baptist Association, that's a mouthful, uh, provided one of the first analysis of J.W. Dungy's life that was not alongside uh, a study of his children. In our work, we learned that Dungy played a pivotal role in the establishment of Baptist churches and engaged in the local politics in Virginia, in Virginia as well as Minneapolis. All right, so his early life. <clears throat> Uh, John William Dungy was born into slavery in New Kent County, uh, Virginia in 1833. It is alleged that he is the child of the United States 10th president, John Tyler, and an enslaved woman named Susan. As a child, he worked in the home of the Farrell family, often serving meals to the family and cleaning up after. When the Farrell family moved to Alabama, he became, uh, and became absentee owners. Dungy was hired out to former governor, uh, John Munford Gregory. Starting in 1855, he actively began searching uh, for a way to obtain his own freedom. In February 1860, an opportunity for that emancipation uh, arose. So what happened was, uh, the Alabama, uh, the Farrell family contacted Governor Gregory and said, hey, we want you to bring Dungy down to Alabama. And he said, this is my opportunity, right? So he said, hey, my mother's sick. Can I be granted a pass to go visit my sick mother? And Governor Gregory gave him the pass, along with $5. So, J.W. Dungy purchased his freedom for $68 to get on the Underground Railroad. He had $68.15 to his name that he earned, and the ticket for freedom was $68. So he had 15 cents left over. All right, so how do we know about J.W. Dungy's story to freedom? William Still, who escaped slavery himself and uh, began helping uh, other enslaved African Americans make their way to freedom, um, had the Underground Railroad record. And in that, he would receive letters, communications, do interviews. And so what we know about J.W. Dungy's escape from slavery is through William Still's uh, uh, record. Yes, I will, sorry. My students are always like, Professor R.C., you're always moving. <laughs> it's a dancer in me. All right, so <laughs> J.W. Dungy's escape from slavery. Um, he obtained, uh, obtained the pass, and he got on board a ship called the Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> on his way to Philadelphia. He spent three days in... Um, like a cupboard behind cooking utensils, and he couldn't even stand up. 
And so when he finally got off that ship, he's like, thank God. Like, wouldn't you be like that way if you had to crouch down for three days? And they said, John, you're not safe yet. Um, and so following through his path to freedom, I discovered a uh, February 1860 article from Frederick Douglass's paper that accounted that John William Dungy had passed through Rochester, New York two days prior of, of Fe February 17th, 1860. It's likely that uh, John W. Dungy passed through Rochester, crossed over into Canada through Lake Erie, and spent most of the Civil War in uh, Brantford, Canada, uh, where he remained for the duration of the Civil War. All right, so after the Civil War, uh, John W. Dungy uh, uh, studied at Oberlin College in Ohio. And then it got a little bit too expensive for him. Uh, like most, most of his college students, school's expensive. <laughs> nothing's, but, nothing's much changed. So he transferred to Bates University, which was a, 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 a seminary-style school in Maine, where he attended there from 1866 to 1868. He was the first verifiable African-American student to be enrolled in that institution. After his education, he became an ordained minister, and he helped establish and since spent some time as the financial officer uh, for Storr College, um, and began traveling across um, like the upper northeast region, so think like Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, a lot of time in Minneapolis, establishing churches. Um, the earliest uh, church that we, I have found that he established was in 1867, and that was Mark Cromwell Free Baptist Church in Winchester, Virginia. And of record, it's about 10 churches that he had found, found during this time. In addition to his work as a minister and was, as the financial advisor for Store College, he also started a monthly journal called the Harper's Ferry Messenger. So a little bit about his family. He eventually came back to Winchester, Virginia, and married Miss Lydia Ann Taylor on February 1st, 1870. Uh, the union of Dungy and Taylor resulted in the birth of ten children, five of which reached adulthood. The oldest of uh, the Dungy children, Ella, was born in Virginia in 1871. In 1913, she married Alexander F. Williams and eventually became the secretary for the YWCA. The second oldest child, uh, uh, Drusilla, was born June 20th, 1876 in Harper's Ferry and she became an activist and a scholar in her own right. There's some great books, um, Uncrowned Queens, that really highlight her work. Um, their third child, Blanche, was born December 21st, 1880, in Roscoe, which is most noble for our, our community here in Oklahoma City. He was born on June 21st, 1883. And the last of the Dungy children, Mr. Uh, Irving, was born June 3rd, 1889. Uh, he not only became involved with the Communist Party and was uh, a managing editor of the Chicago Enterprise until his death in 1935. John William and Lydia Dungy's children grew up in a home that encouraged them to be involved in the communities and they were taught by their parents' example. Wherever the Dungy family resided, John William engaged with local politics by advocating for the rights of newly freed African Americans who were trying to navigate Reconstruction and the Southern backlash. One example of this was in August of 1875, the Colored Education Convention in Richmond, Virginia, um, came together to discuss the difficulties facing newly freed African Americans within educational settings. On the second day of the convention, uh, Junji aggressed the crowd and over the subject of having a more efficient training for black teachers in Virginia. Essentially, he argued that the two normal schools that accepted black students uh, were not adequate and did not deserve uh, aid from the state. Um, particularly, he was addressing the Hampton Institute uh, because of their uh, sectarian institutions, so their religious affiliations. And this is another story about him. So, uh, and during the election of Ruther B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden, he actually went for Tilden. His argument was, that the Republican Party was marching black voters to the, uh, to the polls without really uh, allowing them to vet the candidates and make the decision themselves. 
right? So we got a lot of backlash. Um, there's a fellow minister going throughout the congregation saying, don't go to Dungy's church. Don't be associated with him, right? So he's not afraid to go against the grain to speak up for the rights of African Americans. All right, the reason why we're here, Oklahoma. So the Dungy family arrived in 1892, 1893. He got his commission um, for, from the, to be a missionary here um, in 1892. Uh, they arrived uh, on a hot summer day. It was 100 degrees, and before then, they were in Minneapolis. So they came in with their heavy clothes, and they're like, I'm from Chicago and I still haven't acclimated uh, to the hot Oklahoma <laughs> sun. Uh, so they came home. They came to Oklahoma. Um, they got a quick bite to eat at Brooks Restaurant, uh, which was a safe haven for, for black travelers and black diners here in Oklahoma City. So the Dungey family uh, essentially started sell settled um, on the northwest quadrant of, the sec of Section 20 in the 12th Township west of the Indian Meridian, uh, which is currently located at the intersection of Northeast 36th and Westminster in Nakoma Park. Um, based on the historiography that I've read, uh, Dungey had a $200 a year salary, which afforded the Dungey family uh, a little bit more luxuries than their neighbors. So for example, uh, their neighbors might have had a sod house or um, um, uh, uh, Dugouts, that's the word that's in my notes. Um, on this land, they built a small frame house uh, filled with good furniture and a library containing a thousand books. This became a resource for his children. His collection of books included books by Frederick Douglass, Joseph S. Gibson, George Bancroft, if you take an American historiography, you know Bancroft, um, as well as numerous scrapbooks and compiled in newspapers and magazines. And there's his land grant from 1901. So some of the work he completed while in Oklahoma. So upon arriving in the territory, J.W. Dungey quickly immersed himself in his work in the community, mainly education, churches, um, community-based organizations. One example that I found uh, was on August 4th, 1894, he helped organize an Emancipation Day celebration at the fairgrounds in Oklahoma City. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the festivities began with a free barbecue, and then after there was a, a kind of a, a dance at the flower hall. Later in the evening, the Dudgey family gave music concert uh, for the attendees, and throughout the day, speakers engaged in audience, engaged the audience, including J.D. Randolph, who was one of the first principals uh, of the old black schools here in Oklahoma City, uh, who gave a talk on subjects of the failures of mixed schools. Uh, Miss Ella Dungey uh, gave a essay entitled, What Has the Education Done for the Colored Youth in America? In the territory legislators, the topic of segregated educational facilities was at the forefront of the debate. Dungey and the organizers of this event used the premise of emancipation to bring members of the community together to engage in an open forum regarding the education of black youth in the emerging state. J.W. Dungey helped establish the Choctaw Normal and Industrial School in 1895. Dungey, along with his neighbor, D.W. Anderson, granted 10 acres of their land to this institution. I have found newspapers discussing how Dungey was the president and discussing this institution, but a part of working this summer as I want to find out more. I think that would be a really interesting topic to explore. Uh, uh, Dundee's involvement with the education of black Oklahomans did not stop with the organization of the Emancipation Celebration. He often acted as a spokesperson uh, for the local community regarding education. One example of this is that on January 9th, 1902, uh, J.W. Dungey uh, presented a petition signed by 60 women to the Board of Education regarding a Miss Susan Turner. Uh, Miss Susan Turner was, uh, nice way to put it, conduct unbecoming a lady, and she wasn't focused on the teaching of the, of, of the children. So they didn't want her teaching the young black students, right? So he acted as a, as a voice for the community in education and church. Talking about church, um, he, he traveled, throughout the central Oklahoma, and some of the books it talks about how he traveled on horseback, um, going through and establishing churches. But here in Oklahoma City, on Northeast First, um, he helped establish Tabernacle Baptist Church, 
which has remained one of the most influential and lar largest black congregations um, in the state, it is now located in our Northeast, northeast 36th. According to the church uh, charter, five members of the Dungey family are founding members. So the death of Dungey. <laughs> so the death of the patriarch of the Dungey family came as a shock to his family. He passed away in his home in Oklahoma City at 11 in the morning on Sunday, April 19, 1903. J.W. Dungy's experiences and commitment to the uplift of his race influenced his children, which in turn, uh, which in turn dedicated their lives to race work here in our, in our state. By examining the life of J.W. Dungy and his family, we can see the influence of early black settlers had on the creation of Oklahoma City's culture and community. So where do I go from here? Like a lot of the speakers today, um, the pandemic made me very reliant on uh, digital archives. So what I would love to do this summer, first, I want to connect with some of the Dungy family. Um, like I said, I'm not from Oklahoma, and so I want to get connected because it's very important that I, I tell the proper story in the second chapter of my dissertation. Third I want to do is, uh, there's a really cool news article from the Sun Journal in Maine where they're talking about William Still and J.W. Dungy exchanging letters. I think that will expand the story if I'm able to find those. The journalist found them, so I think I can find them. <laughs> um, I would like to find copies of his Harper's Ferry Messenger. I think that would be a great articulation of the black perspective after Reconstruction, right? And if we see any comparisons between the black dispatch and what his father wrote, I think that would complement my second chapter as well. Um, what else do I want? I have a whole list of what I want to do. I want to see what happened in his time in Canada. Like his time in Canada is a hole in history, right? Is that historical black hole, what happened? Um, so I want to find out, see what's up there. And so that's my plan. I really believe that by acknowledging the history of black Oklahomans and families like the Dungy family, we can see how these stories are not just a part of broader Oklahoma history, but a part of broader African American history, and essentially a part of broader American history. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. I couldn't catch the date on that slide. And my question is, Macomb Park was developed by the Nichols, as in Nichols Hill, yes. Mr. Nichols. And so was this an area that uh, welcomed black folks, or was it something, I mean, how did they end up, I mean, is there a connection to that? Uh, yeah. Because Macomb Park, you know, I mean, it's just right down the road. So yeah. Um, the research that I've done so far, I, it, he is surrounded by, like D.W. Anderson, it's local black communities, right? Um, so part of what I, what I wanna do this summer is dig deeper into that and see um, what other uh, black families around the area, what the culture was like over there. Because I know there was a drought in, <sighs> the Dunchy family moved from this uh, area because they were really big into the farming, like subsistence farming, and they moved to like 10th and Bryant. So I want to find out more about that move, and I want to find out more about um, the circumstances around the area. Because if there was a school out there, like, that shows community. And I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Probably with, I got vaccinated, so I can, I can, I can, I can start exploring. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't seen any connection with the moving to Kansas or Uncle Sam and going back to Africa or anything like that. I haven't seen any connection with that yet. Maybe. I'm still digging. Very much work in progress. Yes. What was the question that this gentleman asked? Oh, he asked about if J.W. Dungy had any influence on uh, the migration of black Oklahomans to, to Canada or um, there was a brief moment, even before Garvey, um, where Uncle Sam was promoting uh, uh, black Oklahomans to go 
uh, back to Africa. As he was asking if there was any influence in that. It was uh, also Liberia, yeah. uh, Monroe, Liberia, yeah. uh, was another place because my great grandfather left from here and visited there in 1921. Um, uh, 1920, excuse me. So, I'm touch base with the Africa. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, other than Roscoe, uh, the other three children, are John, uh, who were they again? Uh, we have a Miss Priscilla Dungy, and if you read any of my other work, I'm absolutely obsessed with her. Um, she was an activist, historian. Um, we have a Miss Blanche Dungy. Um, I'm still digging up on her. Um, the, what I can find about her is she passed away in Arizona. She's buried out in Arizona. Uh, we have a Miss L. Dungy, um, and she was the one who became the secretary of the YWCA. And then we have Irving Dungy. Um, he was very active in the Communist Party, and he was a uh, newspaper editor for the Chicago Enterprise. I'm not going to step here in front. I don't know that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Because um, I know we started getting one like 40s, 50s, getting me in my historical brain. Um, when, uh, when Roscoe passes away, like, I know Jimmy Stewart starts taking over a little bit more of the mantle, and you have a transition there. So I need to um, I need yeah, check out the extra dungeon. John Dungy, and I, was, I, I knew of him. Like a nephew, maybe a nephew. I've heard about a nephew. A nephew? Probably, maybe a nephew. Because uh, I've, I've read some stuff about a nephew. Yes. So Roscoe and John, the later John, are uh, very well been cousins. Yeah, cousins or uncle, uncle nephew relationship. I've read, I've read tidbits about a nephew. I'm really sitting in that early territorial period because there's already some great scholars working on, um, like Claire Looper in that era, and I don't want to step on their toes and be disrespectful. I love it. Like, I'm open to all tidbits of knowledge. Like I said, this is very much my dissertation working in progress. If you worked on dissertation. My larger project. Oh, my larger project, um, creating black space, um, is just really grappling these concepts of race, place, and identity. And how in Oklahoma City, we've created, there was a creation of a, a, a black ethnic enclave that was politically active, that was challenging Jim Crow. Um, and essentially what I'm arguing is, if we can look at places like Baltimore, right? If we can look at places like Detroit or Chicago and acknowledge these black communities, we can acknowledge these black communities here in Oklahoma City and connect Oklahoma to, to larger U.S. history. Because I think sometimes um, we don't get talked about as much as we should have. So that's my larger project. Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, like it's a whole entire thing. Like there's uh, black owned businesses, there's black owned, like there's black churches, right? Um, so it's, it's its own community in itself. But yeah, with, with the Tulsa Race Massacre and, and especially the work with Roscoe Dungy, it becomes like this epicenter. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it was a whole, 
There's a whole community. Like there was a, the New Orleans style funeral home, um, different kinds of bakeries. We get into the 1920s, uh, particularly um, like the Aldrich Theater, Deep Deuce. I mean, there was a whole entire community here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>